Good evening. Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Fiona Lettis, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation here at UEA. Um, it's a real privilege for me to introduce Professor Andrew Fern tonight, uh, particularly as I had the pleasure of uh, being in the office next door to him until quite recently as well, so know each other reasonably well. Um, Andrew's main areas of research are consumer behaviour, inter-organisational relationships and value chain analysis. He's the founding editor of the International Journal of Supply Chain Management and author of over 150 journal articles, book chapters and conference papers. He is the 14th Adelaide thinker in residence and the son of a Kentish pig farmer, the significance of which, in his own words, is revealed through a tireless work ethic and a positive approach to all opportunities and challenges, which I think we'll see some of tonight. Andrew's applied research has involved working with organisations large and small from around the world at all stages of the food chain. Corporate partners including Dunhamby and Tesco, with whom he's been working for the last 11 years, making good use of the enormous data resource provided by the weekly supermarket purchases of 1.7 million Tesco club card holders. This research in turn equips Andrew to advise farmers and small food producers in their development of sustainable business models and marketing strategies. Andrew's also conducted substantial collaborative research with major food industry players such as Unilever and Sainsbury's, as well as trade organisations and NGOs, including the International Institute for Environment and Development and Oxfam. In addition to his research, Andrew is passionately engaged in the coaching of disability sport for people of all ages with physical disabilities and learning difficulties. Andrew is currently Professor of Value Chain Management in the Norwich Business School. In the lecture this evening, Andrew will look at the ways in which the sustainability of our food supply chain is something many take for granted. Climate change, ethical sourcing, food integrity and food-related illness are just a few of the challenges we, we need to overcome. Without behavioural change at all stages of the food chain, many stakeholders were suffering the same fate as the dinosaurs. So Andrew is going to challenge us to positively wake up to the challenges ahead. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Andrew Fern to give his inaugural lecture. Thank you very much, Fiona, and thank you all for taking time out of your precious day to um, join me in a bit of uh, self-indulgence. When I was asked what I'd like to um, uh, give an inaugural lecture, I thought um, for a few minutes about whether I would, uh, whether I'm worthy, whether I should. Um, and then I thought, well, I've not done one before, and it seems like a real privilege, and it feels like a real privilege uh, to have 40 minutes or so to share with you some of... Um, some of my experiences and, and how I see um, this huge challenge of sustainability. I was also sharing with um, Fiona my concerns that, in fact, it's already too late, with Fiona. Um, I, I, those, those of my colleagues that know me will know that most of the time, in fact, 99% of the time, my glass is half full. Um, but I couldn't help discover, finding myself through, as I was building this, preparing for this lecture, that actually this is... Um, this is not one of those lectures where I'm going to inspire you with all the ways in which we're going to save the planet. In fact, I'm going to share with you what I continually come up against, which is the reality check, which is so much of what we hear about behavioural change in the context of sustainability is wishful thinking. And what I want to share with you is the concern that I have that it's actually a long, 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 long way away and we don't understand a fraction of what it really means. And we should, and we should um, treat with great caution those that believe they do know what sustainability is and how we get there. So one thing I kind of proud my, pride myself on is, the cho is, is choice of words. Um, so not everybody agrees with my words and not everybody understands my words, but I do choose them very carefully. So I probably rewrote this title several times. Um, but notice that there is a key word there which is challenge. So I am sharing with you what I perceive to be a challenge. I'm not sharing with you the result of 30 years of research that results in a solution that no one yet has, has, has wised up to discover. So it is a challenge. Um, but I hope, I hope there's something in this, uh, in this presentation for everybody. Um, if I have to apologise, I guess, for any, for any um, budding paleontologists who thought they were going to come to see pictures of bones and dead dinosaurs, I'm afraid that I've got some pictures of dinosaurs, um, but I know about as much about dinosaurs as you do. I just hope I've spelt some of their names correctly when we get to that part of the presentation. 
So you've had the, you've had the introduction. Um, that's, by the way, that's what you wear when you're dancing with dinosaurs. Um, and I've been, I've, been, I've been incredibly fortunate, and I'm truly grateful. I think it's an amazing profession that, we, that we're in, academics. We have the, the joy of standing aside. This is how I see this. Standing aside from the real world, because it's going on out there. Um, and when we're invited to come into that world to contribute, um, it's like the kids being given the keys to Toys R Us at Christmas. When you're invited up and down the food chain, inside organisations, inside sectors, countries, regions, inside the uh, living rooms or the kitchens of farmers who are grappling with the daily pressures, it's a joy. Um, and, I'm, and I am... Um, Mum always said pride comes before a fall. But I am proud to have, have origins as humble as they are uh, in a pig farmer from Kent and Daz Long Gone. But I spent the most amazing 18 years of my, uh, of my life um, driving tractors and mucking out pigs. So, in the risk that I may upset some people in using this dinosaur analogy when talking about stakeholders in the food chain... Um, I want you to know that I care passionately about this sector and interact a lot with it. And I guess it's because of that passion that I'm concerned that we take so much for granted. So I've got knobbly knees. You can see I've got big ears. I try and use my big ears. So I was blessed with these. And as I've been travelling around the world for decades now, up and down the food chain, from multinational corporations to peasant farmers in southwest Africa, I try and make sense of what people are doing. Um, and I, that's, I think, my job as an academic, is to try and make sense of the world. Share some of that with my colleagues, share some of that with students, and if any of that sharing results in some things changing, that's wonderful. Um, but I'm also a realist, so I've, I don't believe that's likely, um, but who knows. So, um, I've got uh, a fair amount of stuff to get through, um, but I've got three fairly straightforward um, parts to my presentation. I'm going to talk... I guess probably for 15 minutes or so about the challenge from different perspectives. And I'm not going to go in, into any great detail about the state that our food industry is in. Um, because I can't believe anybody in this room isn't aware of all of the significant challenges that the food industry is facing. I will touch on them, but I want to get into um, associated issues that I see from the industry perspective and from a particular personal perspective. I'm an applied microeconomist. So my first degree was French in economics. I did a PhD in policy forecasting back in 1983 in Newcastle, which was a hotbed of research around the common agricultural policy. We were already swimming in wine lakes. We were already being covered up with butter mountains and grain mountains. And 1983, people were wondering about the future, how we cope, what will happen to the reform of the common agricultural policy. Um, and my PhD was all about predicting what politicians would do, interacting with business, who remember were, still are in many parts of the world, a very powerful lobby force in managing policy reform. <laughs> if I was able to predict the, f uh, the future, um, I guess I possibly wouldn't be standing here now. Um, but I built a model and um, did the usual thing. It got published. And it was all about trade-offs. So the trade-offs that politicians make when seeking to make decisions that satisfice and optimise enough stakeholders that they retain their jobs. Uh, so from a very early age, I became very sceptical about believing a word that anybody said, least of all politicians. And I roll forward now to, what is it, 2017. Are we in? Yes. And two years from now, guess what? The world's about to come to an end. For many people in our industry who see Brexit as the end. Why? So for this particular group of people in the food industry, they see the demise of their um, single payments, um, policy reform must come. We can't afford to subsidise. Oh, my goodness, it's the end of the world. Back in 1983, when I was busy policy forecasting how we're going to deal with milk quotas, there were these weird and wacky people talking about diversification and the need for farmers to find different ways of um, generating revenue and not be so dependent on, on the taxpayer who was subsidising their exports and storing their surpluses. And I thought, these are weird people. What's diversification? How, how insignificant is that? We've got to get on with predicting what the policy will be so we can uh, um, uh, influence that process and get government to make the decisions. And then 30 years later, I guess it's about 30 years later, isn't it? Or something like that. It's a long time down the line. Here we are again. 
Brexit's on coming for, if you're a livestock producer in Ireland, the world is about to end. You're about to lose your single biggest export market. Farmers, there aren't very many that have a positive, um, you know, a black number when you take off the single payment from the balance sheet. The world is coming to an end. And now I see myself thinking, and about time too. And the opportunity is to turn adversity into something very, very uh, positive. So I'm, looking, I'm sharing with you perspectives from a narrow um, discipline. I am an applied microeconomist. Um, so I still reach into my e economics toolkit, but in, I've dabbled. I'm also one of those boundary spanners. Supply chains are where I'm at. I talk to farmers, I talk to manufacturers, I observe, try to observe and talk to retailers, distributors, um, consumers, policy makers. And in that process, I'm spanning organisational boundaries. And in order to have reasonable conversations, half-decent conversations, because I'm sometimes in very unsecure ground, I need to talk more than one language. And that can mean that sometimes I know just enough to be dangerous. This is def desperately difficult territory. I must move on from my intro slide, otherwise I should be in serious trouble. But I'm sharing with you a perspective, and I'm very comfortable these days with being completely wrong, but it is mine. One thing is sure, this is my perspective, um, and I expect that not all of you will recognise the things that I'm sharing with you. And that's good, because I can't have been where you've all been, and I'm going to tell you where I've been, because that's my privilege for this evening. So, the challenge, how on earth do they get OLC rate to grow in that part of the world, in that strange place? The challenge, in summary, so food is what we're talking about, and this slide is just summarising very, very simply, um, the challenge of sustainability, where we've got these social, environmental and economic perspectives. What's appearing on the screen are you know, simplified versions of a number of challenges that result in a picture of complexity. Most of us in the business school, and I'm coming at this as an applied microeconomist, are fundamentally rooted, it's gone now, uh, down here, looking at economics. And the rational economic model in me will say, that's where most businesses are. Let's get real about this. If you're not making a return on investment, if in some way you're not profitable, nothing else matters. And it only starts to matter, the other things, the social and environmental, when it affects the bottom line. So the food industry, thinking about, think about it, it's got lots of companies in there that have to make money. So we're focused, most of us, most of the time, and the government is too, how do you fix obesity? How about banning the PlayStation and banning donuts? And that stroke, it's gone. How many governments are working on legislation to ban the PlayStation and ban donuts? Not very many. Choice editing, not a very popular option in countries that believe in freedom. Give people freedom, what do they do? We're most of us selfish individuals. We focus on ourselves. And it's only when our selves, or in the case of businesses, our bottom line is affected that we might think about changing behaviour. But it's damn complicated. And for every one of those boxes, there are people focusing on that bit of the problem. The experts in ethics, in supermarkets, in biosecurity, in succession planning, in climate change, quite understandably as academics saying, these are very complicated areas. So drilling very deeply to fix, focus on and fix their individual bits of what is an incredibly complex um, nexus, that's a good word, yeah, complex nexus of challenges. And we really, really, really struggle as academics. I'm sharing with you my perspective, having worked with many, annoyed even more, uh, and walked away from a fair few too, before they walked away from me. The challenge of having those conversations and making sense of them is very difficult. And I think it's just as difficult for people in business and people in government that are working out a strategy for navigating through this sustainability challenge or policies to support the process. The stick is coming, but who's going to wield it? How big will that stick have to be and how bad do things have to get before the stick is wielded? Necessity is the mother of invention. It's all coming, it's all coming. The sad thing is we could be doing so much more to preempt much of this, I feel. So in a nutshell, I think from a consumer and a society perspective, we are selfish people. 
we are paying for the excesses. I think, I'm, I'm exaggerating now to make the case, right? But we are getting our dues for being incredibly selfish, adopting cheap food policies that means we can consume more fat, more carbohydrate, without a thought of the damage that's doing not only to our bodies, but to the environment and to other parts of the world. So from a consumer and a society perspective, we're paying the price. Business, <laughs> struggling with this one, what are they trying to do? They want to be sustainably um, more competitive than other businesses. So they're searching for a, a, a policy, a strategy, a way for making more money year after year after year, or at least some sort of money, a return on their investment, that keeps them ahead of their competitors. So they're trying to add more value. And they're trying to do that at lower cost. And they're trying to do that faster than anybody else. If they can do that, you might say, that's a damn good recipe. They ought to be succeeding. But you know the bit that's missing, because there's a bit of a gap at the bottom, which is only, in the grand scheme of things, it's only relatively recently that we've, we've moved from paying nothing but lip service to sustainability, to now thinking, do you know what? If I try and reduce my carbon footprint, I might spend less on energy. So should we do that then? Because the accountants can say, Let, let's do that then. So enlightened self-interest means we're going to work on our carbon footprint. And that becomes part of our CSR strategy. It's actually a mechanism, or it's part of the strategy, for reducing our cost. And we're not quite sure about that other thing, but we'll do it anyway. It'll, it'll justify our investment in the marketing team. Um, what they are waking up to is the fact that doing all of that is damn difficult. Whether you're Tesco, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, actually, you can't do it by yourself. Ah, so I need to work with other people then. Yes, can't do that alone. Pause. So we've got this huge complex problem. No one can deny it's coming. Brexit is coming. We have got no idea what the impact is. The ice age is upon us. What's gonna happen? Constantly we have these crises that we hope will be a cause or a, or a catalyst for good. I want to feel positive. But sometimes it feels like jeepers. I've been here so many times, having had conversations like this for so long. So part of the problem is that we as academics and businesses focus on what people say rather than what they do. I'm communicating to you part of the challenge. I believe part of the challenge is we don't understand the problem. We don't understand what's going on. Our source of evidence is weak. And we as academics are partly responsible for that, how we are incentivized, how we are rewarded. So we need to focus more on what people say. Why is that? So the traditional model is you raise the awareness of consumers about how irresponsible their behavior is, of businesses about how irresponsible their behavior is, in order that they understand how irresponsible they are behaving in order that they might change their attitudes about how they behave. And then what happens? We ask them, are you now going to change your behaviour? Of course we are. Um, what happens? Well, that's necessary. Of course it is. Um, but actually, it's not sufficient. Because now we are getting you know, overwhelmed. No, 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 be careful. We're getting more evidence that there is a gap between what people say and what they do. What they say and what they plan to do and what they end up doing. Their circumstances change. They forget things. They lie. When asked what they're doing. So that means we have this attitude, intention, behaviour gap. The bulk of our research around behaviour, I'm, I'm um, sharing with you, is finishing around about here. Would you buy? Would you do? Will you change? Have you done? Not here. Because the evidence you can't see because my thing won't shine, uh, around behaviour, actual behaviour, it's very difficult to get. So this reference to Tesco now is important because for the last decade, although I'm not going to share much of that with you at all, for the last decade we've had this joy of looking into shopping baskets of 1.2 million people. 40% of households shop in this store. We can see what they do. If I ask you, Show of hands, how many people care about the impoverished, starving people in Africa? Put your hand up. 
I would hope everyone's hand, if it could go up, would go up. We care about people who are starving and very poor in faraway places. If I then ask you, how many of you have bought fair trade products ever? Pretty much the same number putting their hands up. If I now ask you, how many people have bought fair trade products in the last two weeks? The number of hands now much, much less, but those that are still going up are making that an habitual part of their decision-making process. But we've gone from 100%, so I'm going to exaggerate now, to about 20%, who are buying fair trade products on a regular basis, despite having said they're really concerned about these poor people who can't feed themselves. Now if I ask you, how many people buy Kit Kat? Put your hands up. Oh, you liars. I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Someone's honest enough to admit they buy a Kit Kat. So, no, that failed, Fiona. You're supposed to all raise your hands. Just make me feel good. Have you, ever, have you ever bought a Kit Kat? That's better. Yes. And because you're the wrong people for me to talk to, you've all changed your behaviour, so Kit Kats are out of your diet. Well, what happens, certainly happens with student classes, all the hands go up. And what's the point of that? So... That means actually everyone in the room is supporting fair trade products. Everyone in the room is buying a fair trade product, but most of those consumers don't know they have. Why? Because they're buying it because it's a Kit Kat. How does that get translated in the media and the NGOs? UK consumers, the most civil society in the world. Look at the market share of fair trade products going through the roof. When the majority of them, not you, because you're a different breed, are buying these products because the corporations have taken out an insurance policy. Which means that when someone says, what on earth are you doing in these places where you buy this stuff from? They say, it's okay. We're being checked out. Look at the back of the pack. It's got a certificate on there. They are taking this, and that may or may not be a good thing. It may or may not work. The reality is, however, consumers are not buying those products because they care about the problem. Does that matter? It's a kind of soft stick. If we can get the industry to change their behaviour that results in a good outcome for society or for the environment, does it matter that consumers care? It matters if policymakers and indeed many, many, many other links in the supply chain believe consumers are the route to sustainable behaviour. So there's a big gap here, and that's a problem, the challenge, the gap. Now, this slide, then, the focus switches to businesses. So we've got a problem with measurement, and I think companies and policymakers have a, prob have a problem with measurement too. It's now significantly less than half, isn't it? This is a bit of a depressing slide. So, what do I, how do I reflect on where we are today? I could have written this slide, I think, 30 years ago. I didn't, but I think I could have done. Um, particularly when those... CAP reforms, I was forecasting as a PhD student, were about to happen. But of course they didn't, because there was a very strong voice saying you can't do this to farmers. Anyhow, the industry are busy worrying about other things. You won't get too many CEOs going on telly and saying this, but in brackets they would say more important things than saving the planet. More important things than social and environmental sustainability. We're trying to save our businesses here. Why is that then? So huge uncertainty, rising input costs, availability of labour, increasing volatile exchange rates, and of course climate change, which means jeepers. Where we've been sourcing stuff from for generations, we won't be able to source in five years' time. Someone tell me, where can I get my onions from in 2020? Unilever went to Azerbaijan because they thought that's where we can get onions from in 2020. And they thought, wouldn't that be good? They'd like us there, wouldn't they? We could transform their lifestyles at the same time by giving them lots of contracts for their onions. Guess what? The Azerbaijani farmers said, you know what? We don't want your contracts. We're growing these onions for our domestic market and it's doing very well, thank you. There isn't a sustainable deal in here because what did the manufacturers of canor soup say? This is great, but don't expect us to pay more for the onions from Azerbaijan. Because we can't compete with the other businesses if our input costs are going up just because we're, pay we're paying more for the, in that case, Azerbaijani onion growers. So I'm really worried about where I'm going to get my inputs from. And I'm not convinced that I can get consumers to pay more for my canola soup that's now gone up in cost. How many days do we hear manufacturers say, our oh, imports are rising, you've got to charge more. And the retailer says, oh, forget it, chum. We're not charging any more for anything. 
and this, this is going to happen everywhere, because consumers don't get this message, and I'm not sure I get it too. I'm not convinced that all of these costs that you're saying you want to claim back are for real. So, first one is uncertainty. Not a good place to be. None of us like that, unless we're, a, unless we're paying attention here, a velociraptor. So, structural imbalances. Excess processing capacity, but not enough inputs. Major problem structurally in many, many parts of the world. Certainly, in my opinion, a major problem here. Too much stainless steel chasing not enough inputs, which means manufacturers are paying inflated prices for stuff that shouldn't be produced because they have to, to maintain the throughput of their factories. To do, why? Because their business model is one of competing on price. We can't compete on price if we can't be efficient. We can't be efficient if we don't run the factory 24-7. We need carcasses, we need animals, we need vegetables, we need stuff. If we can't get it locally, we get it from far away. But won't that add problems to our carbon footprint? It doesn't matter. We've got to run the factory 24-7. Go get the onions. Fundamental disconnect between, I still see this. There are, without a doubt, golden examples that, of the opposite in the room. And I'm not doing this to upset anybody or provoke outrage. I've done that too many times when talking to farmers who have got close to pinning me up against the wall as I try to explain to them rationally why the milk price can only go down. They don't want to hear that. Uh, but a fundamental disconnect, I think, remains. A fundamental disconnect between primary producers, manufacturers and retailers. The food scares, the, the bad news continues to drip out. If I was feeling really gloomy, which I clearly am now, as my glass continues to empty, um, it's only, we're, only, we're only hearing about the tip of the iceberg. Who's going to invest in the systems to reveal just how much everybody's cheating on everybody else? There's no vested interest in the food chain for anybody to invest in systems that reveal the truth or anything close to it, so they won't. And keep our fingers crossed that we don't get caught out. So, fragile relationships. As a result of fragile relationship, information is not being transferred as it's supposed to according to the textbooks. We don't know where stuff has come from. We don't know where it's going to. If I ask my small producers who have just won the contract with Tesco, and where are you selling your product to? They're still busy popping the, con the uh, champagne corks for getting a contract with Tesco. They say, do you what? I said, so where are you selling your products? I don't know. I get an order that comes in every Thursday. And I dispatch to a depot, and I think they send it out to some places. They don't know. 95% of them don't know where their products are being sold. And guess what? Most of them are being sold in the wrong place because they assume that Tesco would have worked that one out. So Fern Sausages, Tesco's going to find out where to sell Fern Sausages. Guess what? They don't do that. So a lack of trust, it goes badly wrong. You stuffed up on my product. Whose product was that? Your product. No, my product. Who stuffed up? Well, I assumed that you would know where to sell it. We would assume you'd done your research and told us where to sell it. Neither of those conversations happen. 30,000 food products, 20 million shoppers, 3,000 stores, 5,000 suppliers. How many emails can you respond to? How many phone calls can there be? In Tesco's local, there are three people purchasing 5,000 products a year from three, 400 suppliers. Try and work that out. Imagine what it's like dealing with that. Do you feel sorry for them? No, evil Tesco. No, of course not. But the reality is they can't do the things that we'd imagine they'd have to do. Decreasing profit. Everyone's losing. No, everyone's making less money than they used to. Competition's rising. The race to the bottom continues. So rationalisation will continue. There's going to be fewer of every link in the chain. And some would argue, and not soon enough. We've got to get rid of the cowboys so the big boys can take over and do this job properly. Driving up economies of scale, investing in the robots that will replace the people that we can't afford anyway, or we can't access to now in two years' time. So we're going to fix this by getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more efficient. So necessity is the mother of invention. Right? So now we come to the dinosaur story. So 65 and a half, I have to, I have to read this because I'm not a paleontologist and don't quite know what happened, but I'm, so I'm going to read it out to you. So we can read it together. 65 and a half million years ago, there was a large scale mass extinction of animal and plant species. 
Whatever the cause, the amount of solar energy reaching the Earth's surface changed. And species that depended on photosynthesis declined or became extinct. The food chain was altered. With no plants, there was no food for herbivores. With no herbivores, there was no food for carnivores. So these groups became extinct. Those creatures that did survive did so because they had options. They could live on dead plant and animal matter or on the creatures that lived on dead plant and animal matter. So adaptability was the key to survival. Okay, so now we're going to play, please play with me, just indulge, right? Play with me, a game, a little bit of a game, an interactive game where I need you to join in. So here we go, we're going to look at some dinosaurs. And I want to think, I want you to share with me who you think in the food chain these dinosaurs resemble. Present company accepted. Remember, I am the son of a pig farmer, I have ridden tractors, and I have mucked out the pigs. And I, they mean a lot to me. And that's no clue as to who this, is, who this might be. But here we go, Stegosaurus. Tiny head and brain, apparently. Me, I've done my research. Many consider to have been the least intelligent of all the dinosaurs. Clever design. Plates running down its back served as a means of temperature control. In those difficult days. Uh, spikes to protect itself against meat eaters. So I ask you, who do you think that sounds like? And you can choose anybody from the food chain, and your answer is? Politicians. <laughs> Good. So here we are. Here we have a different perspective. Politician says one. Go on, others. Anybody? Supermarkets. Supermarkets. They've got to be the first one coming up, haven't they? Supermarkets, politicians, nodding, nodding, nodding. Okay. So here we go. That's mine. So when I, and I'm sharing my perceptions. When I hear people talk about different stakeholders in the chain, goodness sake, when will farmers wake up? For goodness sake, when will they get into the real world? Why can't farmers adapt? I was at Steeple Bumpstead, which I thought was a, a, a double axe, Steeple and Bumpstead. I discovered it's a wonderful village in Suffolk, uh, which has the oldest farm discussion group in the country, founded in 1925, and they got around to inviting me just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So a room not quite as big as this, it was a church church hall with 30 farmers aged 80 to 18. The average age is probably above 60, 65. Not all of them stayed awake. Um, but they would be the first to confess that they're struggling with some of the things that they have to do to survive. And they did have, have had a comfort blanket. They had two comfort blankets. One was equity that they've used to borrow against to pay off the debts, which the banks now are not quite willing, so willing to use. And the other one was the government, who subsidised their existence. And it's a wonderful existence that they were happy the government to subsidise them for. So I'm going to suggest, to, my suggestion to you is that Stegosaur might be uh, resembling the primary producer. So you can't have them now because they've gone. So Velociraptor, swift thief. <laughs> I, 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 I fear the same name is going to come up <laughs> at every point. <laughs> Carnivore, a predator and they hunted in packs. Any variation on the government or retailers? Sound like a Velociraptor? Hey, supermarkets, any more? Of course, I'm gonna speed up because you're gonna get bored, aren't you? Um, but, because- Economists. Economists, <laughs> wow, I like that, yeah, why not? Yeah, I won't ask you why, because you're gonna be insulting. Uh, so, here we go, I think this is a breed, well, this is a stakeholder that is approaching extinction. Informa Pardon? <laughs> yeah, we're coming there. They might be there somewhere. So information is ubiquitous. We all know so much more than we used to. So this role of disintermediation, increasingly retailers cutting out the middlemen, increasingly manufacturers cutting out the middlemen. The only agents and merchants to survive are those that are now offering more services. I think it's a serious... So I really think they are swift thieves. Telling one part of the chain that there's a real shortage here, the price is going up, while the other one they're telling there's a glut, I can't pay you so much. And in the old days, there wasn't the internet, there wasn't the ubiquity of information, so the buyers and sellers relied on the agents to tell the truth. Hmm. So for generations and generations and generations, they haven't been telling the truth. Triceratops, herbivore, lived in herds, thought to have had sparring contests, locking horns and butting heads. Which is just what, who does that? It's the government, it's the retailers, it's the retailers. Anybody else butting heads? Who's left? Who? Other people. 
Other people, yeah, shut up, Fern, get on. So I'm, I'm saying this is like, man, this sounded like manufacturers to me. They, they, um, they live in herds. So we have to gang up to defend ourselves against the retailers. But we're also competing for market share. So we want to gain market share from the other triceratops. As we defend ourselves collectively against you know who and he's coming. So the Brachiosaurus, that was a friendly one. So a huge plant-eating dinosaur, heavy and slow. Very long neck to reach to the top of trees. Good to man or beast, so there you are. Who's that sound like to you? Actually, not so much to politicians. Oh, that was the wrong answer. So I reckon, that for me, I, I, avoid, I avoid the government with a, with a long with a barge pole. What do they know? They're up here somewhere trying to fix things. They can't get down to where things actually happen. They're busy formulating industry strategy, policy for change, sustainability with no real understanding of what's going on, on on the ground, in factories, in households, in the real world. That's the miles away. But lovely and friendly and cuddly, and they won't kill you. Well, they might. Not. Now, here we go, pterodactyl. So, flying reptile, preyed upon fish and other small animals. This is the clue here. Opportunistic, swooped on just about anything it could get. Where is he? It has to be who? <laughs> who? Tory party, dead. Well, there you go. <laughs> and we're being encouraged to do this. Just take that grant money and focus on that bit. Do that job. And it, it is, I'm glad I've got, some, got, I've got some reaction. But it is quite worrying. Because it feels that like increasingly we, we are becoming like the pterodactyl. Surveying this landscape that we know is incredibly complex. Incredibly complicated and very important. And knowing that actually we can't do the things that often we're asked to do by ourselves as economists, as environmental economists, as biologists, as all of those other disciplines. But if that's what the funding body is going to ask us to do, then that's what we're going to do. And if they ask us to do things together, we'll pretend. We'll pretend. I'm, pr I'm prompting academic, my colleagues to come back at me. I've, I've done enough of those EU projects and other multidisciplinary projects to know that there's a smoke and mirrors job going on. So we're not, we're not doing what we need to be doing. And that leaves us with the big boy, Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrant king lizard, carnivore, possible binocular vision, active predator, short arms which weren't very useful, huge head that could swallow a human in one bite. That has to be, doesn't it? Who? Who? <laughs> Who is it? Which stakeholder is it in the food chain? Has to be the supermarkets. It's got to be. They've got to be T-Rex. Yeah. Very, very nasty people is what we see them as. I asked you, how many of you have been that close to them? How many of you worked with them? When you get inside those organisations, how many you discover they don't have the answers to all the questions. They don't have a bottomless pit of cash. Their margin on a packet of sausages might be that big, and how many billions of pounds did they invest on creating an infrastructure called supermarkets that we're very grateful for, because it means we spend less and less on the food that we consume. We don't understand at all the economics of retailing. We take very, very simplistic shots at what supermarkets do, and I find myself increasingly defending them to people that don't understand how they work and make all kinds of assumptions about the people and the processes therein. So, we spent 10 minutes with a few chuckles there, reflecting on a whole bunch of potentially dinosaurs. Are, are they all, are any of them going to become extinct? No. The number of farmers is going to decline. The number of manufacturers is going to decline, if not for any other reason then. The people that are selling their products retailers, are shrinking their product range. In the last two years, Tesco's have reduced their number of products by 30% because they say, you don't want so much choice. And guess what they do? By giving you less choice to make it easier to shop there, they allocate more space to the brands that remain so they can screw them a bit more. For the margin they receive, that means they can continue to make money and offer you the most irresistible deal, which is great quality, at rock bottom prices. 
And how many of you, well, you're a funny bunch, but how many people out there say, that can't be right? Most, far too many, the overwhelming majority of consumers are saying, thank you. We don't wish to pay any more for our food. So the, the trouble with this is, and I believe, I believe in this stuff, so bear with me. As you can see, I feel passionately about the, the problems of stereotyping. I've just done that with you to try and illustrate a point. Stereotypes are partly a result of what people do. They're partly because people do the things that we've just talked about. Behaving opportunistically, cheating, exploiting. But they're also partly because of how we choose to look at them, which I think often is from a position of convenience and a distance. It's so much easier for me to ask you what you purchased than it is for me to actually see what you purchased, so I will. And it's so much easier for me to ask you or to take a view about you by saying, what do you think about Tesco and the retailers? And you'll tell me what you think. And that's good, I've got evidence now. I can report these interviews I've had with people that have told me. Stereotypes become embedded in people's perceptions if they don't change their behaviour and we choose to observe them from afar or from a very narrow disciplinary perspective. Perceptions drive attitudes, attitudes drive behaviour. Change in the behaviour that we want to make this system more sustainable is then thwarted. I love that word, but you'll understand the Chinese students don't know what it means. And that's not me being racist. I say this often in class. There are words that I love. Thwarted. I think I'm probably the only person that uses it. Thwarted. They can't do the things they want to do. Refusal to believe in the ability of others to change. Retailers do that because. Farmers can't because. Manufacturers will because. And then this beautiful term of workaround. So we work around these obstacles to get the job done. We don't deal with the fundamental problem. So we need to break the mould from within, not wait for others to see the light. And that's where, in theory, I suppose, and perhaps in practice we'll see, we come in. So we're trying to work on breaking the mould from within. My message is, don't wait for someone else to fix things. It's not going to happen. How bad will it have to be before the government does start to seriously regulate? My theory is jumping to the end. My theory is it will come way too late and it will be far too late. How much of a mess? Because we don't understand the scale of the mess. And we don't understand the complexity of responding. Many of my scientist colleagues will tell me it's already too late to fix so many of the problems that are building up, particularly from the environmental perspective as companies and governments are in denial. We're not doing this first, we'll wait for others to do it. So, the, the approach to this is looking at the value chain rather than specific bits. Why do you want to do that? It's all about being more holistic, extending the line of sight, uh, and that's about being focused on processes, cross-functionality, multidisciplinarity, which I accept completely is very, very difficult. I've already shared with you it's very, very difficult. And if something is difficult, you either take the Homer Simpson approach, which is it's not worth doing, or you devote more time and effort to work out how to do it. I think too many of us take the Homer Simpson approach. We might pretend to be doing things in a cross-functional, multidisciplinary way, but we're not, because it's too hard. So the paradigm shift we as academics, maybe even policy makers and advocates wish to see, and we talk about happening as we reach out for the examples of best practice, which I think are the exceptions that actually um, uh, make, make the rule, break the rule, is that we want to shift from this supply chain orientation, where everyone does what they want to do and pushes it through the system. That's the excess. We're going to do this. It costs us this much. You're going to pay us this much back which means we have these weak, adversarial, fragmented relationships and a cost plus. We're trying to move towards a value chain approach where, and it, start, you know, it starts to unravel, but we have a consumer. Now, if that consumer is informed, if that consumer is enlightened, if that consumer is willing to pay for things that are produced in a certain way, let's even think there that their purchasing behaviour could become more sustainable. And if everybody else is connected to what that consumer is willing to pay for, there's now a return to be made. 
the industry has an opportunity. What I'm saying is that's where we, most of us believe we need to be. I still think we are light years away, light years away from being there. And I want to, sh I want to demonstrate that unless you're going to shut me off. No? Uh, please do when you're, if you think I have to. Yeah. Um, am I right? Ten? Five? Ten? Five, ten. Five, ten. Two examples. So I'll, I'll quickly go through these. Um, because you were very kindly agreeing to indulge me at the beginning, and you have done. So, um, two examples. So I'm not making this up, and I could give you loads, but I've given these two. So, the, quick, the first quick one is the example of why you cannot expect consumers to, to bail us out. If the consumer doesn't bail us out, nobody else in the food industry will do anything. Because who's going to pay for it? That's the... Gloom, Ice Age is coming upon us. So the story here, for those of you who can't remember it, this is to Terry Leahy doing his thing back in 2008, trying to change the world by informing consumers so they can make choices, enlightened by the fact that they are doing good things for the environment. They did it piecemeal, all by themselves. I'm conscious that we're being recorded. But this was a classic case of, we're going to do this all by ourselves, despite the whole world saying, this isn't right. And we're going to do this, we're launching this, we're going to have significant pressure placed on suppliers to join our cause at huge expense. And in the end, four years later, it all collapsed. During that process, there we were doing our research around behavioural change, because we believed in this, and really thought, we really thought we could make a difference. Where? We think the difference is to be made where very few people go, which is at the point of purchase. So I'm taking you back to slide number three, which was it's all about impacting behaviour, not what people say. How do you impact behaviour by making that intervention where they are making decisions? At the point of purchase. So that's a model. Yeah? So a sort of thing that academics create. They measure stuff and they play about with things to see whether there's any impact. And the thing we were playing about with were these in-store situational factors, which is, now, which is now referred to as shopper marketing. Let's try and influence people at the point of purchase. Trivial, you say. Incredibly powerful, I would suggest to you, if we can make it work. If, if. So what do we do? We started to do things. We're creating interventions that we thought would be swimmingly successful in explaining to people why they've got to change their behaviour and seek out the lowest carbon orange juice potatoes um, the washing detergents, etc. So we'll take on, we'll, we'll, we'll focus on young families because surely they care most about the sustainability of the planet. And we we'll work with primary schools and we we'll work in store and we we'll use our club card data to work out where we're likely to have the greatest impact. So what do we do? We create Carbon Footprint Week and we get schools to sign up. We design an entire curriculum plan to embed carbon in the school curriculum. And we'll have a competition with a prize for the best school that participates. Yep. And then in the stores, around these schools, we'll have staff wearing shirts, we'll have uh, point-of-sale material explaining what carbon labels are all about. We are designing this, we are paying for this, we are monitoring its impact. If we weren't doing any of this, Tesco would have just carried on and ended up doing the same thing anyhow. Um, point-of-purchase material and big fat stickers saying... This is why you're here. Or at least be aware of this activity going on. Classic, classic outcome. 70% said this homework, this exercise was really helpful. Helped us understand better what was going on. 28% said they had purchased a low carbon product as a result of this. And 13% said they are likely to in the future. So you start at a high level of interest and it certainly very, very quickly falls. Shoppers. So we asked people as they exited stores. Um, did you see anything? And often, uh, the majority of them didn't even notice all of that activity going on. When prompted, they said, 28% said the carbon labelling will definitely influence their purchasing behaviour. What, what I'm showing you very rapidly here is, we did lots of things at the point of purchase, where you know you make sudden switches to buy brand A and brand B. What did we, what did we discover? That's what we discovered. Noise in the data, no impact for all of the products. The maps, the graphs were exactly the same. This was a pilot. It was an exercise in research where we tried to influence people where we thought young mums going to the supermarkets with their young children making the right choices. No impact whatsoever. 
I'm not saying that this hour of research prompted Tesco to end it. It was quite clear to us they were way ahead of their time. The second example is this thing called value chain analysis. And I will speed up now because I need to get to the end because I'm conscious that, that um, we've all got other things to do apart from indulge me. So scope for improvement everywhere, but not everybody's looking at it because they believe the problem lies elsewhere. Value chain analysis seeks to shine a lens along a value chain, supply chain, where we identify opportunities for improvement. So we've done this in lots of places all around the world, including in recent years, respite care in, in, in Kent, security cameras, and last year we even had a go with Lotus cars. So we've done this in lots of contexts where we've developed frameworks for measuring things that identify how things could be better. This particular story is about um, Vine to Dine. This is one of the, this is probably my um, most highly frequently uh, cited publication. It's all about bringing life cycle analysis that measures the impact of a food chain on the environment with value chain analysis which measures the economic um, performance along the food chain. And here you have an industry back in 2008 that was at, an, at a point of crisis, coming out of the, one of the worst droughts in history, being challenged by South American wines with a major export market, the UK, um, declaring war on the environment and them feeling very, very vulnerable. UK, the largest export market, Tesco, the single largest um, consumer, Tesco trying to lightweight its products, saying to the South Australian wine industry, you need to get your act together to support our strategy. So everyone gearing up to invest in saving the planet, or at least the bit of the planet that the wine industry was destroying. So we then talk to lots of people and we conduct the life cycle analysis. So this is our attempt to bring these two disciplines together, understanding environmental impacts, emerging that with economic impact. So what do consumers tell us? They tell us that there's lots of reasons why they buy wine. You know that, because you will buy wine, I expect. And the things on the left-hand side are what really mattered to Tesco consumers, which many of you perhaps won't be. What, don't, what didn't matter to these consumers, for an industry that was about to invest millions, if not billions of Australian dollars, was the environmental credentials of the wine that coming from that country. Don't spoil my wine consumption occasion by making me feel guilty about the air miles or the damage being done to the environment as these Australians try to grow more grapes for less cost so we can buy cheap Aussie wine that is still quite drinkable. Not interested. So what do we do? We then say, okay, let's look at what's happening along the food, in this case, the wine chain. Different aspects of production. The letters relate to what consumers think about is going on in that part of the chain. As you talk to each part of the chain, you identify ways in which they could save money or add value. But essentially, upstream, happening in almost every sector, farmers, primary producers, do not add very much value. They find that difficult to come to terms with. All the adding value upstream is being done by those life science companies where the V is by the seedlings. So you get the rootstock, the genetic raw material, and you follow the instructions. I've been told to quit. If you don't follow, and that's all you do, and consumers don't care about it. So focus on efficiency. The value is happening in the abattoir, in this case in the bottling plant. So we'll get any raw material we can to maintain our throughput, and we might just screw up if we rely too heavily on promotions because that will cause havoc with forecasting demand. We then overlay that with an understanding of emissions. What do we discover? Most of the damage is being done upstream where people don't care very much the production of the grapes. There's a little bit going on in the packaging but be careful because that's the bit that people value. Don't tamper too much with the packaging otherwise you risk losing your market share. And the expectation was that there'd be all, these, all this damage done as a result of the considerable miles that this wine travels across the globe. Not very much at all. We look at the dotted lines that show that information does not flow seamlessly. We colour the lines that tells us there's a fair bit of green, which means relationships are good, in dotted lines that show that information does not flow. So even if I love you, manufacturer or retailer, I'm not sharing information the way I should. If I have a red line, there's a very good reason why I'm not sharing information with you. This is the ex an x-ray of a patient that is terminally ill with whatever disease you want to call. 
So I can show you many more x-rays like this. The most significant finding, and I'm almost there, is this. For the government, lost with what to do to save its wine industry, thinking that saving the planet would be the route to achieving that aim, it was this. If you look at the contribution to carbon emissions in the value chain, it's all happening upstream. Do consumers care about that? No, they don't. Are industry going to invest in solving the emissions from the wine chain? No, they're not. Should government be messing around with winemaking and labelling? No, they shouldn't. So as a guide for R&D policy, that kind of analysis is incredibly instructive. Which means we come to the conclusions. I've given you two examples of why it doesn't work out the way we think it should. And you're all feeling like that. Feeling like that. I'm, I'm joyful that I've, you've allowed me to indulge myself for more than time than I really usually get. So, what have I learned? Some profound learnings over 30 years of dancing with dinosaurs. What I've learned is that assumptions are the mother of all stuff-ups, right? And there's a book by Nicholas Taleb, The Black Swan, the best book I've ever read in my entire life. A reformed trader from New York who now is a philosopher, an arrogant individual, who at least acknowledges that we don't understand what's going on and we ignore these extreme events at our peril and we're also content with doing stuff here where we feel comfortable. We have to take risks if we're going to change the behaviour of people that are in denial. Looking at the markets in aggregate from afar and organisations from afar leave us blind to what I think is a very complex interface between people, products and processes. I believe sustainability is an elusive goal. I remain interested, engaged, but increasingly pessimistic about, in my lifetime, our ability to come to terms with it. I think it's a complex challenge that demands holistic thinking and collaborative resource allocation that I don't see happening anything like enough. Labelling is not the answer, in case you want to ask me if it is, but I don't think Jacqueline's going to allow you to do that. So, but don't expect consumers to lead the way despite their reported willingness to pay. Sustainability, whatever it means, I don't even think we know what it means, is an aspirational state that the market will fail to deliver. Regulation, I believe, is inevitable, but it will come too late. So the best slide is always a simple one, and the very best slide, of course, right now is the last one. This is it. So behavioural change starts from within. We all need to look more closely. I'm trying so hard to look more closely. Listen harder. I'm trying so hard to listen harder and speak more clearly. I'm trying to do that too, and often failing, because otherwise, this is what's going to happen. Good evening, and thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I'm Jacqueline Collier. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Social Sciences, and you started at the beginning of this saying that it was a privilege for you to be here to talk to us. Well, I think I speak for all of you when I say the privilege is ours to hear you speak so passionately and so on such a committed way about this subject. But you started as well saying that your glass is 99% of the time half full. But I wondered, Australian wine? Does that go Actually, they've done well. They've been, they have done well. Yeah. I'm, just not going to, I'm not going to claim the, the, all of the, or even any of the credit for it, but you're right. There, there, there has been significant, if that was a question. Yeah. Or, you know, actually, what was, this, what was part of the solution was now, as we know, all of the wine comes across in tankers. And it, so we're still selling it in bottles because yeah. that's part of the consumption experience. But we have significantly reduced the carbon footprint by simply changing the way we transport and bottle the wine. Um, and you know, R&D is underway, funded by the government to make the production of grapes more sustainable. So we, we make small steps. Excellent. So I've got lots of things I would like to ask you, but I've had my one question. So I'm going to open this up for the audience. Um, and do any of you have questions for Andrew? Do 
you know, I think that's a really good question, a good observation. And I, at the time, I felt we, or at least if, with the benefit of hindsight, we felt they were ahead of their time. Um, and you'd like to think, wouldn't you, that our level of understanding, our knowledge of concern about the challenge of environmental sustainability would give it more of a chance. Um, so I, I think, yes, um, but I'm going to say accept that. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Tyrannosaurus Rex with the Velociraptors scrapping for their share of the market, when actually... My, 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 I possibly didn't get that ac across as well as I might. Part of the problem with that initiative was it was them operating in isolation, um, refusing some of the advice offered them from other people, um, being selective with the people that they worked with because they had decided they were going to fix it, they were going to give a lead, and everybody else would follow. So although I think maybe as a, a larger share of consumers that would be more disposed to seeking out low-carbon products, for that initiative to really work, I think it has to be industry-wide, supported with government, so it's, and indeed with the Department of Education and the Department of Environment, not just one company trying to fix things all by itself. Are you going to get Tesco to jump into bed with Asda and Morrison's and Sainsbury's and Uncle Tom Cobbley? The reality is, I don't see that happening. I still don't, which means you're going to get regulation, are you? Are we going to get government telling the retailers, you will do this? They're going to say the evidence shows it doesn't work. So I, I started being positive there, and I ended up being bloody negative, didn't I? Thank you, Andrew. Yes. Um, I think there might be an answer that, uh, that has not come up in your, in your uh, I'm sure. dinosaur collection, Russ. And, uh, and it's, um, it's uh, a conservation organisation that I've been looking at recently for the UWF. Right. And they can do some really interesting things all the, market, all the value chain. They're looking at the food system. Mm the biggest impact on, uh, on the environment and hence they're really hitting their, their research there. Mm -hmm. And in good particular, I, I found a really good talk, TED Talk, by a chap called Jason Clay. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that talk, but it's, mm -hmm. it's really nice to watch. And he was showing how uh, he's been interested in deforestation and, and halting it. So he done some analysis of Latin America to see the top companies that were involved in agricultural production. And uh, whittling it down, just to cut the story short, they got it down to uh, a handful of organisations that they could work with. Cargill, the big ones, you know, that are yeah. doing global agriculture. And um, he he gave, he, so he set up a lot of certifications with, with these, you know, you'll know about the soy bars and the round table and the like. Anyway, he, he No, time. no. Your mum's going to stand there yes. and read it. Yes. You're not. You're going to pick the, the cheapest and not yep. and grab the nappies and out, out the supermarket yep. door. Yep. So, uh, so I thought it was a, a, it was a, a force within the value chain yep. that the really has some potential yeah. to move the dial. I would love to say. They weren't there because I don't think they're dinosaurs. Uh, but, uh, but I can't claim that. But I, um, but I agree wholeheartedly. And what I would, so I, all I would say is I agree with you. And what I observe with NGOs is that they are becoming more streetwise. They are, they are understanding how to get more of their message across. And they're changing who they have those conversations with. So part of... They are adapting. So instead of standing there on the sidelines, you know, slating the stakeholders for not doing things, they are recognising that you've got to get in with these people, you've got to understand their world, speak their language, and work from within. So I think that example you gave is a great one. Let you know, get the supply chain to sort this. Uh, 
all I'm pointing out is that elsewhere and in many supply chains, they're not in a fit state to get in the same room. But people like the WWF, NGOs, streetwise NGOs, I think there's a significant role for them to play, for sure. Thank you. Now, I know there are lots of questions left, but we are running slightly late, in part because I wanted to give Andrew full time to uh, talk to us about his passion here. And what a fabulous talk. Thank you. So I think that point is probably a very upbeat one on yeah, which good. to finish. Um, so I, in a moment, I will ask people to express their thanks to you, Andrew. Uh, but we also have some wine and nibbles outside. I'm not sure how we sourced them, but <laughs> we'll have a look at the labels when we get out there. Um, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.